An idea I've been thinking about a lot recently is the idea of the two kinds of Jesus. I don't remember ever reading this idea. Maybe it's original to me, I don't know. The idea is that there is personal Jesus and there is New Testament Jesus. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'll begin with a story. I know a man who wanted to marry a woman who was Catholic. She wanted a Catholic wedding. He went to talk to a priest. And at one point, he asked the priest, why do you allow yourself to be called Father when Jesus said, call no man Father? And the priest said, Jesus never said that. But the man was able to find the verse in the Bible and showed it to the priest. And the priest said, well, well Jesus didn't mean not to call anybody Father. The story indicates two things. One, that many Christians aren't familiar with the words of Jesus. I mean, this was a priest who studied many years to become a priest, and he didn't know everything Jesus said. And two, how many Christians, even when they see the words of Jesus, they say the words don't mean what they obviously mean. Now, it's a strange phenomenon. Imagine someone who said they were a tremendous Harry Potter fan, and you mention Hogwarts, and they say, what? What's that? Well, that's the school in, in those books. And if they didn't know that, you'd wonder, how could they be a fan? Yet there are people who say they're totally in love with Jesus, that it's a relationship, Jesus speaks to them. And you mention a line in the Bible and they don't recognize it. How can you follow Jesus if you don't know what he said? And it's not that hard to know what he said. There are Bibles that have the words of Jesus printed in red. The way I understand this is people have a personal Jesus and then there's New Testament Jesus. Personal Jesus is the image they have of Jesus, and often Jesus is perfect and loving and kind and, and God, right? They've decided all that, or been told and they believe. And then if you go to New Testament Jesus, it's, it's quite a different story. Matthew 5, Jesus says in the clearest words possible, don't take any oaths. Here they are. But I say unto you, swear not at all, but he ends up saying, let your yea be yea and your nay nay, for anything more than that is of evil. Other Bible translations have of the evil one. But anyway, he's saying don't take oaths. Now, a lot of Christians apparently, well, a lot of Christians obviously don't follow those, those, those words. They'll take an oath in court. They sell them swear to tell the truth, tell the truth, nothing but the truth. If they enter the military, if they assume political office, if they become a citizen. And yet they claim to be followers of Jesus. I think many such people, if you showed them these words, they would not know they were there. And then they would probably go to their pastor or maybe invent some explanation on the spot as to why these words don't mean what they obviously mean. So in my view, they have their personal Jesus. And their personal Jesus tells them it's okay to take us. New Testament Jesus says something different, but they really don't know New Testament Jesus. Most Christians, I think, don't know New Testament Jesus. For instance, if you go to Matthew 15, Jesus says, God commanded, I'm quoting now, Jesus says, God commanded, he that curses father or mother, let him die. Now that's an Old Testament commandment. He who curses father or mother uh, must be put to death. And there's Jesus saying that God said that, that God commanded that. I hope no, well, no Christians follow this, and I hope they don't start following it, because this is an evil, evil command. Am I saying Jesus is evil? I'm saying the character in the New Testament, yeah, this is an evil teaching. But I'm not saying anyone's personal Jesus is evil. Of course not. Anyone's personal Jesus is, is good. He's God. And that brings me to another point. I think that people's personal Jesus is a face they put on God. I mean, after all, we're human beings, and if God, if God exists, God is something so far beyond us that we kind of have to make a representation. I imagine on another planet, intelligent beings who look like rabbits, and they worship maybe the great furry rabbit because they need something they can understand. So if God exists, but God is infinite and beyond all thought, and by the way, there's a whole line of theology called negative theology, which basically tells you what God is not, but says, I can't tell you what God is because God's beyond all words. So this is a part of, a recognized part of theology. So everyone makes up their own image, Jesus. And that's why you could have uh, two sincere Christians talking about some controversial topic, homosexuality, abortion, um, politics. 
and they can be certain that Jesus is on their side. Jesus can simultaneously be uh, for ostracizing and, 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 and killing, even killing gays, and for accepting them and loving them. And other examples could be given. And the explanation for this, now of course, uh, people will go to the Bible and try to cherry pick lines that, that support their version of Jesus. And I don't think that's very honest. It lacks integrity. Uh, if you get a red order edition and you see everything he said, but maybe you ignore three or four things which don't agree with what you're trying to argue with and just pick one or two lines that do, that's not an obvious, that's not integrity. That's kind of cheating. Which brings to mind a point I've made in another video called the Bible Bait and Switch. It's how believers think or claim that they're following the Bible when they're doing no such thing. They're following the preacher. And this starts very young. In Genesis, which is the word of God according to Christians, God, in his very own book, used the word serpent. It was an evil serpent that tempted Eve. And the preacher says, oh, that was Satan. Well, it could have been Satan, it could have been Darth Vader, it could have been the ghost of Christmas past. But if God wrote a book, I don't think I'd be correcting it. You know, it's like, do I know better than God? Like God uses a word and I say, well, no, no, no. He meant this other word. There's a little scenario that comes to mind when I th think about this point. We imagine an elderly man sitting in a chair and saying, grandson, would you help me find my slippers? I'm going to go out for a walk. And the grandson says, granddad, don't you mean your shoes? You're already wearing your slippers. And the old man says, yes, yes, of course I mean my shoes. Well, that's, that's understandable when an elderly guy or even a younger person, maybe you're distracted and you say the wrong word. But God's holy word written or inspired by God himself, which has lasted through the centuries and millennia, and the word is serpent, and some preacher says, hey, well, let's make this say Satan. And the, and the believers the, the believers say, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Well, it may make sense to them, but it doesn't make sense to me. Because once you do that, whatever reason, whatever justification, you can't change the fact that you're following your preacher, not following the Bible. I'm sure you know, an apologist, a Christian apologist, would argue somehow that it's okay, it's the right thing to do, um, all sorts of arguments. But fundamentally, you're either following what the Bible says or what your preacher says. If the Bible has that Jesus said, call no man father, well, you either follow that or you don't. And people will try to argue context and all sorts of things, what the original Greek said, and etc. But you have to remember, the Bible is translated by scholars who have spent their lives studying the ancient languages that the Bible was written in. And not only that, but I'm sure, I'm sure that they pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance when they begin to translate sacred scripture into a, a version of the Bible. For instance, in Matthew 5, we are looking at the words of Jesus himself, not merely, you know, in other parts of the Bible, there's like Moses, there's some prophet who tells you what God said. Fine. But I'm saying it is secondhand. But here in Matthew 5, these are the very words of Jesus in his very own book. Yet Christians will say, well, it doesn't mean you can't take those. And they'll give you reasons. But my explanation is simple. Their personal Jesus tells them it's okay to take oaths. And New Testament Jesus says no. And th this, this pattern has, there's many instances. Today, New Testament Jesus says nothing about abortion. Anti-abortion Christians, I'm sure, would say, some of them would say that they're 100% certain that Jesus feels a certain way. People in the South, when they had slaves a few centuries ago, the Christian slaveholders, I'm sure, were 100% sure that Jesus was okay with them owning slaves. When the Catholic Church was burning witches for a few centuries, torturing it and burning or hanging a poor old woman who had been accused of the imaginary crime of witchcraft. I'm sure there were a lot of priests and bishops and maybe common people who felt sure that Jesus approved of doing that. By the way, New Testament Jesus doesn't say anything against slavery, uh, but nothing for it either. But there are other verses in the New Testament that seem to endorse slavery, like slaves obey your master. Well, all these examples tend to show that people have their own personal Jesus. And as I said, many of them don't even know what New Testament Jesus said, much less follow it. And that's good sometimes. I wouldn't want people killing their son or daughter who cursed them. I mean, I wouldn't want that. So, I believe in God. I believe that for many people, Jesus is a face they put on God as a way of relating to God. I think that that's okay. 
Okay. Thanks for listening.